In mid-November of this past year, my wife Courtney and I entered a hospital in Berkeley, California, um, probably a place, a locale that we think of as having a really solid, in some cases, world-class hospital. We entered the room, and exactly as I had predicted to our midwife, there wasn't a single window in the room. And we knew that we'd be there for the next several days. And so, of course, I got a little agitated, didn't say much about it, but decided to kind of go with the flow. It was all about Courtney in that moment. And started looking around the room a little bit more for some signs of hope. Instead, what I saw were really bright lights that had no dimmer on them. So you can imagine at the height of her labor, that's pretty frustrating. Uh, certainly frustrating for me. I would be like trying to guard her with my shadow uh, from these bright lights. And then as she's laying in this bed, she's staring directly up at a clock, watching the seconds tick by. So about into day one of three, I finally said to her, you know what, as we were doing all that, or as we're doing all this, um, I just can't stop thinking about this hospital that she and I had visited in rural Rwanda. It's called the Butaro Hospital. And we kind of went on with our, our day, and on the, on the third day, the day we were about to leave, we kind of, I certainly was at my limit with this hospital room and this hospital generally, and um, a nurse walks in, and there's nurses that rotate in, and so this is one we hadn't met before, and she's just like, sometimes I think if I was an architect, I would just totally redesign this room. And I said to her, actually, we should have had nurses and patients and doctors designing this room. I said, I'm an architect, in fact. But architects did design this room, and all the things we're complaining about were the architect's fault, in my opinion. And so it was just like this really weird thing. But it brought us back in that moment to the Butara Hospital, and we're going to talk about that for, this, for today's panel. So today's panel is called Buildings That Heal. Um, buildings shape us. Buildings house us, they shelter us. You can think of what a different experience this panel, in fact, would be if we weren't in this space that's made for it. And so no one understands buildings in the way that several of our panelists do up on this stage. And I'm so delighted to introduce them all to you. Um, I, what I'm going to do is facilitate a conversation amongst the panelists. I'll start by introducing them. I'll prompt them to say a few things. We have two videos uh, that we're really excited to share with you. They're very, very brief. And then we'll open up into a broader conversation, not just about this hospital in rural Rwanda, but about the built environment broadly. Um, and so the first panelist I'm really delighted to, um, uh, to introduce is Peter Drobach. Peter is the executive director of Partners in Health in Rwanda. Uh, he's associated with Harvard Medical School. Um, he has lots of other fancy credentials and is this amazing person. But as in that moment where we met in Rwanda when he was giving us a tour of the Butara Hospital, something, something clicked for me. This guy is more than his titles. In fact, he is, as he would tell me, from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, <laughs> where I'm from. And if you wondered where he got his sense of style, I mean, he's the best pe dressed person on the stage. It comes directly from Milwaukee. So speaking of style, Michael Murphy, to his left and to your right, Not the best walked into story. my office in San Francisco in, I'm thinking 2006, 2007, something like that. He had these green docksiders on, these skinny pants. He had this plaid shirt with a plaid skinny tie. And he tells me he's going to design this hospital in Rwanda. And I'm thinking, why don't you just sit down? <laughs> You're still in school. Um, well, let's talk about this. And of course, he and others went on to do exactly that. Michael is the co-founder and executive director of Mass Design Group, this extraordinary nonprofit architecture firm. Uh, has, has offices in Kigali, Rwanda, Boston, Massachusetts, and Port-au-Prince, Haiti. They do work all over the world. It is absolutely unequivocally some of the most important and impactful and beautiful work of our time. And so we're really happy to have Michael here. Michael's colleague, uh, Christian, um, is with us as well. Um, Christian is uh, from Rwanda. Uh, as one does, he just went straight down the street to go to architecture school in, Ru in Shanghai, actually. He literally managed to get from Rwanda through a scholarship, having performed really well in high school, 
uh, to go and become an architect in China with his best friend, Komode, who also worked for Mass, uh, because there wasn't an architecture school in Rwanda. And now Christian and Michael and others have helped start an architecture program at the Kigali Institute of Science and Technology. And so we're so thrilled to have Christian here. Um, and then rounding out our panel is my close colleague and actually neighbor right down the street in Oakland, California, Liz Ogbu. And she is many, many things, a designer, an urbanist. Um, she's the, the founding principal of a firm called Studio O. She teaches at the University of California, Berkeley. She consults with organizations all over the world and um, has been an IDO.org fellow and is just so special um, in so many ways. And again, we're really, really thrilled to have everyone here. So let's to try to wake us all up. Let's give our panelists a round of applause to get started. So. So Peter, we'll start with you. Partners in Health works in several countries. Um, it entered Rwanda several years ago and identified the Burera district as a place where you um, uh, saw enormous need. There was a large population without one of the kind of principal uh, district hospitals and PIH was brought in. Why don't you paint the picture for folks what that uh, setting was before Butaro came about? Sure, thanks, John. So, so we didn't pick Butaro and Barrera District, the government picked it. This was 2007. Uh, we had been working in Rwanda for about two and a half years uh, prior in a different part of the country, another remote rural area in the eastern part of the country, to help sort of build and rebuild the healthcare system, which had been, uh, what existed had mostly been destroyed in the 1994 genocide. And uh, about two years in, working there, the government was looking around all the country at all the different health partnerships, and what they saw was that they thought the results in that area were really good. And Bill Clinton came to visit and he said, this is the model that could save Africa. His words, not mine. And so the government got curious and said, okay, well, what would it take to do this everywhere, to build this kind of system and replicate it in all the other districts in Rwanda? Uh, and this is a, a sort of a unit where you have a hospital uh, that reaches out to a network of clinics called health centers and then a network of thousands of community health workers. And so the government said to us, could you help us? You know, we spent a lot of months together with a bunch of other folks writing out this kind of roadmap for primary health care. Could you help us do this in another part of Rwanda? Um, and, and, and we want to do it, the government, but we'd like PIH to be our company tours and help us get it right. And they chose Barrera District because at the time it was the worst off part of the country, the least developed, the most remote, the most derelict, the health indicators were the poorest in the country. It was sort of the last in the, in the country to benefit from the fruits of development that that, uh, that Rwanda was seeing. We were a little bummed because it was all the way on the opposite side of the country and way, 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 way up in the north and the roads were terrible and it took five hours to get there. Uh, but then once we got there, we saw how beautiful it was and then we said, okay, we can deal with this. Um, and so, uh, so at that time, we started to, um, uh, to, to map out what it would take to build the system with the hospital as sort of the flagship and the centerpiece. And what we saw in the district at the time was, um, was, was pretty stark. Uh, there, were, there were no good roads, there was no electricity, uh, there, were, there was one doctor who had just been appointed a couple of months before to serve the entire district of 350,000 people. He didn't have a hospital to work in, so he was working in this little clinic with a small generator. And when we first met him, he would tell us stories about women who would um, uh, you know, be trying to come to that little clinic um, in, uh, in labor, uh, and they would come on a boat across this big lake um, to get there because the roads were so poor and he you know, told stories of women who were dying on, on boats trying to get there uh, to the nearest place or trying to get to the, the nearest real hospital, which was um, you know, many, many kilometers away. Um, there were lots of folks in those communities who had never accessed modern health care before because it simply didn't exist. Um, some of the most stark poverty that I've ever seen anywhere, uh, you know, Haiti or elsewhere, uh, was in some remote communities in this uh, district of, uh, of uh, indigenous communities or pygmy communities as well, where families were living under, you know, sort of thatched lean-tos on the top of these windswept mountains with no land. Uh, and so that's where sort of this thing started from. And, and the reason that the government chose that place was what they said was, look, this is the, this is the worst off part of the country. We believe in equity, and so we want to put 
these communities first. And it's going to be really hard. So if we can succeed here, we know we can do it everywhere else in the country. Um, and this will be our roadmap to kind of spread these innovations. And so that inspired us a little bit to really make sure that this, if this was going to be sort of a flagship project, um, that there could be a flagship hospital that could really represent the country's aspirations for, uh, uh, you know, for, for the health system. So you just call up the local architecture firm in order to build the hospital, right? Is that kind of how it went? <laughs> Let's hear how it actually went. Yeah. Michael. <laughs> um, yeah, that's sort of how it went, right? There, well, so there, let's say in 2008, um, I guess 2006, I, had the, I was still a student of, of architecture, um, and I had the opportunity to see Dr. Paul Farmer, the founder, uh, co-founder of Partners in Health Speak um, in Boston. And uh, it was World AIDS Day, I believe, December 1st. And it was interesting because he was talking about, obviously, the fight um, for antiretrovirals and all the stuff that they had done across the world, but mostly he was talking about buildings, and he was talking about uh, partners in health building clinics, building hospitals, uh, building homes for people. Um, and notably, in the in this sort of lecture, you know, he said, but where are the architects? Where are the architects that can help us? We've had to do this ourselves. We've had to draw hospitals on napkins and figure it out how to do it ourselves. And, you know, frankly, they've done a pretty good job. If you go to Conj, uh, their clinic in Haiti, which over the last 30 years has been developing, it's this kind of beautiful place and mm -hmm. really dignified. Um, but it was an interesting call to action that very few professionals, architects or planners or designers had been available to assist with an organization as renowned as Partners in Health. Um, so I went up to him afterward and said, you know, I'm an architecture student, but I'd love to see how we could help and then started a conversation. I went over to Rwanda in 2007 uh, and that's where I got to meet Peter and I got to meet uh, another great doctor, Michael Rich, and just started to make myself useful. And after a while, uh, they, they told us about this Barrera project and said, um, well, maybe you can help us. We've been, uh, we're going to do it ourselves. Maybe you can help add a little bit of uh, extra special sauce to the project, basically. Yeah. Um, um. So yeah, so that's how it started. And so uh, when he called me up when I was back at school, he said, well, would you like to help us design this hospital? I said, well, I don't know how to design a hospital, but sure, you've been doing such a good job, maybe we can help out. So that's how we started Mass Design Group. And a core group of us went over to Rwanda and went up into that hilltop and started to think about what it would be to redesign a hospital from the ground up, uh, focusing on uh, the community that's there and the users that would benefit the most from this uh, new institution. Great. Um, we have a beautiful video. Um, this one's on the construction process, and my, my man Tristram in back is going to run this video for us right now. It's actually about rethinking the building itself as an opportunity to protect and inspire the imagination of a community to something better. This hospital was for the people. And the fact that they sweat to make it, they own it far more than if we were just giving them a key. What we're trying to encourage people or through our projects is we're not bringing things to give you. We have things to trade. We want the skills you have. We want the dreams you have, we want the passion you have. There's this catalytic effect. Who's finished, many of them have the skills to go and start their own business or find another construction project. You've now got a place where middle class professionals are moving to, and so suddenly you got this recipe and when it all comes together, you see massive economic development. It's something which is important to see everyone involved. And the more we get involved, the more we make those bonds and the more we live in harmony. I would like to see these masons going to, to Congo and build these beautiful walls there. And I would like to see Congolese carpenters come to Rwanda. We've been constantly asking ourselves, is this all that architecture can do? Or can it do more? Question to myself and to every other architect is, how can we use architecture to contribute to, uh, to peace? So this is the Butara Hospital, this incredible facility perched on a hilltop in rural Rwanda. Um, Paul Farmer, Dr. Paul Farmer, Partners in Health, with whom Peter works, and, and of course Michael and Christian work as well, um, 
has a saying, I believe, <laughs> at least I attribute to him all the time, um, uh, that if you can build it there, you can build it anywhere. And so it's become, the hospital's become this incredible, iconic precedent for us all to point to as, as we have in writing and in talks and um, in other projects. And, um, and yet, it's so much more than that image, and it's so much more even than those beautiful videos. It included people like Christian and others that really have built not just the hospital, but the doctor's housing, the cancer center, and other facilities there with their own hands. And we'd just love to hear from Christian what that process and what that experience is like. Uh, well, thanks. Um, so as you, you may see, the, my country looks a lot like uh, Aspen. Uh, a lot of <laughs> mountains, only at the, exec at the exception of snow. We don't have snow in my country. Uh, but <clears throat> you can imagine when I just graduated uh, from uh, a bachelor's degree in architecture in Shanghai, um, the land is flat, and whenever we'll be talking with our tutors or our professors and we're asking questions, they will, the answers you will start with normally this wouldn't be done because for them in their daily practices they practice on flat sites they have concrete mixers they have graders they have cranes they have all this technology that they're used to so a lot of my answers as an architecture student didn't get answered because my professors didn't really have an interest in what my country is or looks like or what designing and building in my country is so I got back to my country in 2010, excited, ready to change the world. Um, and uh, I started working at the Kikana Institute of Science and Technology, teaching in architecture department. And then I met Sierra Benbridge, who was uh, then the director, country director for Mass Design Group. And she invited me to work with them. Uh, Botaro Hospital was towards the completion, uh, towards the last stages of construction. And <clears throat> The first time I stepped to the doorstep of that construction site, um, it, I, I mean, I, had, I was fresh from architecture school, but that didn't look like any other construction site I had been to in, in my studies. And I didn't see any cranes, I didn't see any concrete mixer, I didn't see any grader, I didn't see any, any brands of uh, factories, products that were lying around. And, and it, wasn't, it was shocking. And, <laughs> But because the hospital was towards the completion, like the finished product really looked nice. And <laughs> like, so that couldn't color it really in, in my head. And um, then I realized I'll have to start learning architecture from scratch because uh, what I would learned was maybe very little relevant to what I was going to do uh, in my career. <clears throat> So I started working on the, on the project with Mustang Group, and uh, I, I had conversations with Michael and Alan, and I understood how the project came about. Uh, I learned to uh, how PIH came into working with people, and, and all of this basically changed my, the direction I was thinking I was going to take in my career, uh, because um, we have a lot of, um, not a lot, we are like 50 licensed architecture in, in my country, so uh, I'm very special. <laughs> but um, a lot, uh, I was lucky to, to have that moment right at the beginning of, of my career that what I've learned is not really relevant and there is a possibility to actually learn what could be possible in my country. Many like myself who work in my country from Uganda, Kenya, uh, Tanzania, or even outside of uh, uh, East Africa and Africa, they, we, we try to force what we know because we don't want to, to, to change our minds. We try to force what we've learned in, into these settings and we push, we basically put effort into pushing these things to happen and the results, as most of you or that probably talk to like in this panel will realize, the consequences can be fatal sometimes when we do that. And I consider myself lucky that right out of the architecture school, I had the opportunity to witness that because it, re it like uh, redefined what 
an architect I decide to be for the rest of my life. So we're done. Um, we're gonna. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, that kind of thing like leaves me speechless. Actually, that's that's a really powerful statement that you just made. I think. So this hospital was designed clearly in partnership with PIH, but also really around the experience of the patients and the doctors and the nurses that are going to be there. And the Masons it, and... And the Masons, that's right. There's actually an extraordinary video on the Mass Design Group website all about this whole cadre of women <coughs> Masons who trained at Butaro and are now some of the most sought after Masons in the region. Uh, so sought after that Mass has to compete to get them back to work on their projects. Um, <laughs> Where, where I wanted to go with, with this around patients is something that Liz is an expert in. Um, it's called human-centered design. It goes by other terms, user-centered design, patient-centered design, but it's basically putting the people that are going to be directly affected by the design at the center of the process from the beginning. And so we'd love to hear, we have some, some really uh, illustrative examples of how that manifests in the building but would love to hear Liz talk a little bit about some, some the main ingredients of, of human-centered design, um, and I'll let you take that. Well, I think that with human-centered design, a lot of it is really that before you can even begin to design, you have to understand what people need and desire. Because if you create something around that, you can create something that people feel a sense of ownership of. If you create something that just comes straight out of your head, it's an interesting design exercise, could potentially even be beautiful, but it doesn't necessarily address the need on the ground or from the desire point, something that people can love. So a lot of our process with human-centered design is just starting with empathy and just sitting down and having a conversation with people. And, and to this point of being an expert and how do you put that hat on the side, um, when I was working at IDEO.org, we used to talk about this idea of humble expertise. And so it's a sense that, like, yes, you are an expert when you go into the room, but you can't even begin to pretend like you know everything. And so whenever I go in to do an interview, whether it's in a slum or Bangladesh or in a um, public housing development in San Francisco, I basically tell people I'm here to learn. I'm here for you to teach me about your life because you know more about it than I will ever know. But I need to understand it to be able to bring my expertise to the table and help you design something around that. So it's really this process of empathy in the beginning, but constantly throughout it, as we're designing, we're figuring it out, we're still going back and talking to the end users and trying to understand understand whether what we're doing is working for them. And it's kind of this iterative process. And at the end, oftentimes you do get these things that people really fall in love with and take ownership of because it feels like it came from them. Mm -hmm. and and so, can, can I say something? Sure. <coughs> this is a very funny story. Um, I had a mason tell me on a construction site that it's impossible to build a vertical wall, like perfectly vertical wall. And I could swear I know I learned in university that it's very possible. <laughs> and I was, I was talking, because they told me, no, we know, we, we build, we are masons, you know? It's, it's impossible. You build it, it's crooked, and then you correct that when you do finishes. And I, could, I, I never learned that in my life. So what I, I came to realize was that these masons work with uh, <laughs> tools that don't, doesn't allow them to do that. And the materials they use, like the bricks, the way they manufactured, are actually not like good quality. So it's very difficult for them to control that quality. Mm. And what we, we realized when we were walking around with the constructions um, on the construction site with our, you know, construction documents, mm -hmm. uh, realized that a lot of it wasn't really relevant to them because our thinking was that okay, I'm going to draw a straight wall, and the masons are going to figure out how to make it, but they can't. So that means all our plans are just fail. Well, and then we started now going back to sketchbooks. We we'll go around with the sketchbooks. And then instead of showing them what we want them to do, we take a sketchbook, we take the materials we have, we take the tools they have, we say, okay, let's do this, do this, do this, then do that. They say, okay, okay, and then we try it. We try it the second time, the third time, the fourth time. And then it, 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 like, uh, once you complete it, it looks beautiful, and then they're like, hmm, that's, something <laughs> and that's how we got most of the work done on site so let's go inside those walls a little bit the walls you just described let's let's talk about this from especially from like a health uh, experience and ultimately health outcome perspective um, Michael and and Peter between the two of you in a, in an abbreviated amount of time um, would love to hear you talk about the configuration of the wards and why 
uh, why that configuration makes sense and, and the kind of health, health outcomes that it, that it um, moves towards, if not guarantees. Let me jump in. So, I mean, when we started to think about this project from the ground up, we, um, I moved to this hilltop. I was living there with, with Peter. Um, and that empathy component was a big piece of this. We were really just trying to figure out the questions we didn't know we had to ask. And one of the first things that came up is, you know, what is the value that uh, design is going to bring to this? And we had to ask that from the inverse. So what's the cost of not having design is actually the way we started to ask that. And we started to look uh, at other facilities that were not well designed and the impacts that they had. And uh, Peter uh, pointed me to uh, examples of, let's say, standard clinics with hallways and, and rooms off to the side and patients are waiting in those hallways and suddenly a, a patient comes in with uh, multi-drug resistant tuberculosis and another patient sits down with another strand of MDRTB and the two co-infect and suddenly there's this outbreak of extremely drug resistant tuberculosis. And while that's a problem of uh, drug treatment and also a problem of um, access to medicine, it's also a spatial problem. It also has a spatial component, right? They were waiting in an unventilated hallway. Mm -hmm. And as an architect, there's very simple solutions for that. We can create spaces which are ventilated enough or keep patients outside of those spaces which aren't um, uh, potentially dangerous uh, by just simple design moves. And we started to think about the hospital from the inside out. And the national plan uh, with the Ministry of Health at the time was a hospital just like that. It had a, uh, big hallways and rooms off to the side, centrally loaded corridors. And so we had these conversations that well, if we uh, put all of the uh, corridors on the outside and everybody had to walk in the exterior and in many ways circulate outside, which was one really great strategy for infection control. Um, and this made us rethink the way in which the design actually performs. And I think our first insight was that the architecture itself, the building itself, can make us healthier. If, it's if some buildings are making us sicker, how can we design to make us healthier? Mm -hmm. So the performative nature of architecture um, really emerged because we had to solve this really, really tough problem. The way we solve that problem in the US is we have massive HVAC systems which churn out and, and, and rotate air through a building. So the WHO recommends 12 to 15 air changes per hour uh, in order to deal with infections uh, that could emerge. So we had to figure out how to do that without any mechanical system using just natural ventilation. Um, and this was a big aha moment for us, that we could design the building to perform at a high uh, caliber with just natural systems. But it meant that we had to design the hospital for this specific context with this hilltop, uh, using a sort of cross ventilation over this hill uh, and, and keep people in the outside as much as possible. So it was a really interesting uh, sort of first lesson of what architecture can do, mm -hmm. uh, not what architecture is. Mm -hmm. And so Peter, describe the patient um, like the, the configuration of the beds and, and what, are, what are they looking at, for example? Yeah, so, so first off, the hospital is designed so that, um, uh, you know, the, it's, a, it's a sort of two-level hospital built into the, the, the hillside um, so that when you're on the top campus where all the inpatient wards are, most of them, it feels like a sort of a single-story campus. And the only people who are up there are inpatients and inpatients' families and caregivers. So it has a real feeling of tranquility. You can see the way it's sort of designed in a loop with this courtyard all the way through. Uh, and so, um, so the, the, the wards were designed such that um, everybody would sort of have have access to a sort of a semi-private courtyard. And, and, and one of the, the great things that, um, that, that Michael cooked up that we had never thought of before, you know, there's no individual patient rooms generally in Rwanda, or very few, they're isolation rooms and things like that. But for various reasons, they tend to be group wards. And so traditionally what happens is you have beds all the way along the outside of say a rectangular space. So if you're lying in bed as a patient, you look up and you stare across um, at somebody else who's staring back at you, um, at, another, at another sick person. And, uh, and so what, uh, what, what we did here, what Mass came up with was instead to sort of invert that and to have a central wall, which is a, you know, a less than two meters high, that the beds would look outward from. And so that wall could be rigged with oxygen, with electricity, and all those kinds of things that we need to provide care for patients. But what it also does is allows each bed to be facing out a giant window which is either looking at one of these lovely courtyards or at one of these incredible valley views. And so everybody has something beautiful to look at uh, when, they're, uh, when they're in bed. And there's a study by Robert Ulrich uh, which traces uh, the patients who look uh, in the exterior, uh, sort of a landscape to patients who look at a brick wall. And it showed 
um, that patients had a shorter recovery times from surgery and took less pain medication just because they had a view of a landscape. Mm. And that kind of evidence-based design is a sort of emerging field which is tying health outcomes directly to design strategies uh, is the kind of other, uh, let's say, field that we encountered by working on this hospital just by thinking about it from the user's perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so let's pivot very quickly into a subject that I know um, uh, means a lot to all of you, and that's what we can learn from this place that is probably the least likely place on earth to have accomplished this. And what can we here domestically learn from that? And you've got, a, you've got a term for that that I know others use, Michael, but why don't you just introduce that to us and then we're gonna pitch it to the audience for Q&A. Well, I think because of this confluence of you know, incredible minds, this amazing health system, um, this incredible uh, capacity of uh, you know, masons and labor, and this commitment to, to build something new in this site, we really had a unique opportunity uh, to innovate the entire system of building. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we recognized some really key learnings. That one, we learned that buildings actually do perform, they affect our health, that buildings are not neutral. Mm -hmm. They either help us or they hurt us. And the second thing we learned is that the building process is also something that can help us heal or hurt us. And what Christian was talking about is, and what PIH was so committed to is hiring as much local labor as possible, using as much local material as possible. Give us numbers on that, by the way. Uh, 4,000 people were hired to build this hospital, all from the local community, and uh, this amazing uh, contractor engineer, Bruce Nizaye, was you know, going to different communities and, and basically creating, organizing labor so that not one community was favored over another, and uh, bringing them to site. And, uh, and it was this amazing kind of huge building project, this big economic development uh, project, and it had a big impact on the economy of that region. Um, and so that process of building is the other key learning, that architecture is about the building process, not about the building, and that architecture is a verb and not a noun. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when we learned that, we started to th rethink our US healthcare systems, and we said, oh, oh yeah, so it's not just patients are getting sick in African hospitals, like we all know that patients are getting really sick in US hospitals. And as you pointed out with your story with Courtney, that, you know, uh, hospitals are not that well designed, actually. Mm -hmm. I would even venture to say they're not designed, that hospitals are engineered. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the hospital becomes this interface, this built, built interface of a healthcare system. Mm -hmm. uh, and our healthcare system is difficult to navigate, and so our hospitals are very difficult <laughs> to navigate. Um, and so what we started to realize is that uh, there's a huge amount of learnings that we could gain insight from working in the global south uh, that could help improve our U.S. medical facilities as well. And so we call that south to north learning. And we think there's a, a huge disciplinary shift in architecture to learn from uh, where we can rethink the system from the ground up to improve our healthcare systems back in the US. Great, great, great. So we have two mics in the audience. We have just a few minutes left. These are very short sessions, but would love to, to have any um, uh, concise and um, pointed questions. There's a couple hands up right here. There's actually a lot of hands up, which is great. <laughs> Um, we're going to do our best to round through people. So if you can make your questions very direct and you can stand up. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. It's great. Um, I'm interested in the cultural context and how you examined that when you were looking at the hospital rooms. And one thing you mentioned was about the beds and how you thought that they would be facing outward. And there was, you know, evidence to make sense of that. But what about in terms of the group or community sense of having others in the room or other aspects that you had to consider that you weren't aware of when you went there? Do you want me to handle that? Peter, why don't we be great? Sure, I'll, I'll start. So, um, so this, this notion of human-centered design that Liz was talking about doesn't obviously apply only to building design, but also to health system design. And, and, and that's why one of the principles that, um, uh, that we hold really central is actually embedding ourselves within the communities that we're working in. And that's why you know, I live in a little village in rural Rwanda, and, and, and we spent two years um, living in a pretty crummy little house up there while we were, we were building this They thing. had bunk beds, in um, fact. The two of them, and uh, and so um, so 
what it means is that we have been embedded with and engaged with communities in, um, in, in, in designing and delivering health care for a lot of years. Uh, and so those communities were engaged in the process all the way through. And so there was, I think there was an element uh, as, as the design was going on of, um, uh, you know, a lot of back and forth where these guys would come to me or our colleagues and say, okay, so a patient shows up, a pregnant woman, what happens next? And we would sort of walk through that process of what she would encounter um, in terms of patient flow and, and different kinds of things and what potential barriers might be. And whenever we weren't sure, there were tons of people around that we could engage and actually answer those questions with. So, um, so I think it was sort of a co-design process with the community all the way through. Great. Um, let's go to an, another question. I saw another hand right there. And then we'll move to the right side of the, or excuse me, to your left side of the room. Hi, thank you. Um, I had a question about materials and how um, you pick out the materials, both in Rwanda, but also when you're thinking about the kind of south to north learning, because I think in, a, in other hospital systems in the States, it's not just about the design, it's also about the quality of the materials, and some mm -hmm. of them are actually really bad for health, you know, human health, so PVC, flame retardants, things like that. So how do you think about that um, in both contexts? Yeah, I can handle that. Christian or Michael, handle. yeah. Uh, yeah, I could, I could talk about this. Uh, so, <clears throat> in, uh, the problem in, my, in, in our country, in my country, is, uh, I realize I'm the only Rwandan in this room, I assume. Uh, <clears throat> the problem with my country is that uh, there's a, even though there's a wheel for, for, for changing, but uh, there's, uh, there's maybe lack of knowledge on what is available. There's little research done on what can be, uh, what can be used and how the uh, people who make legislations and laws tend to deal with that is to copy something they saw somewhere else and put in the law. Okay, this is what you should use. This is the standard. And right now, we actually we have embarked in a campaign to 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 really convince uh, the government to uh, to invest into these things. Like we need to to invest into researching materials. On every single one of our projects, we <coughs> we make sure there's a, a material research component embedded and uh, a capacity training embedded, because we have masons and uh, carpenters and weavers and people who have really great skills. We have volca beautiful volcanic stone. If you've seen the facade of that hospital, is all crafted in volcanic stones. We have we have good quarried stones. We have uh, really good soil with good clay content. We have tons of, of, of grass that can be used for construction, but little investment has been made into these to actually make them safe and structurally sound to be used for construction. And this is what we're trying to, to encourage both on, uh, on like the policy making level, but also on the ground, researching, trying things, see how they work, see that there's a skill we can match with certain material and create something new, beautiful, uh, durable uh, that performs to the uh, quality needed and it's just beginning um, I'm young I'm still energized um, I've uh, dedicated my life to fight for that and I'm very positive we'll get to good results I don't know how in the US you would answer well, that I would just question. want to answer that and uh, uh, jump onto that which is I think your question is really spot-on to say that every material has uh, has a fingerprint mm -hmm. and has a fingerprint uh, when we think about the health uh, of ourselves using those materials. So both its chemical components, but also, as, as Christian's pointing out, they have a labor component too. People make them. People's hands actually build these, build with these materials. And so when we uh, ignore the labor component of the materials we choose, we sometimes, the labor and the, let's say, health component of the materials that we're choosing or sourcing, we're missing a crucial value opportunity to leverage in the construction of, of architecture. And so. You know, if we only choose the cheapest and the quickest material, we would have imported everything from China. But it, we decided to use local stone that no one had really used before in that way um, because it would employ more people and leverage materials that we could get locally. And that, um, that for us is a real paradigm shift, I think, in architecture as well, where, you know, we hope the movement of architecture goes in this direction. And, and when you see a building, you ask not just, you know, what, what, it, what was built, not just your, how it will improve our health, but actually who built it. Now. Let's go. A couple questions over here. Uh, you, you all should be congratulated. On an amazing project. Uh, my question is: uh, the government financed this. They picked the poorest district. So, 
What did you prove? Is the government now convinced that you're going to move around the country and duplicate this? Uh, what's the scalability? Did you come in on budget? Questions like that. Uh, maybe I'll start and Michael, Michael can pick up on that. So the way this project was financed, the, that sort of the health system work has always been co-financed between Partners in Health and the, and the government of Rwanda. Um, for the hospital, the sort of cost sharing was that um, Partners in Health funded the actual construction of the building. Part of the reason for that was if you have, you know, one dollar of government money um, in a project, you sort of get caught in a lot of, you know, a lot of bureaucracy um, and, and tendering processes and things, which actually paradoxically would have made it difficult for us to build this in the way that we built it with the high intensity local labor and things like that. Um, so we financed that portion. The government um, uh, financed all of the, uh, the equipment and furnishings and things like that. So it was about 75%, 25%. And I should just point out the total turnkey cost of this hospital was $6 million. Um, uh, you know, even, even by sort of Rwandan standards, another hospital in the southwest that was built at the same time, which is half the bed capacity and about double the cost. And it's not nearly as nice or nearly as effective a facility. Um, so this is also a very cost effective thing. Uh, one of the great outcomes was because, you know, this, this you know, facility became a landmark from the day it was open and sort of a point of national pride. The government's in very, invested very heavily in its success by making sure that they send great people there to run it um, and to finance it. So right now, um, the government, between government funding and the hospital's own generated revenue, about 70% of the hospital's operations are now funded internally by the government and only 30% by partners in health. And that includes pretty specialized services like cancer care as well. Um, so we see already just uh, three, three and change years into the opening of the hospital that um, the government's already taken over most of it uh, and, and certainly is committed to continue to do so. Uh, we've also seen really great progress in terms of replicating um, some of these lessons, but I turn it over to Michael because Mass has been really deeply engaged in that process of nationalizing and scaling um, our, our learning. Yeah, one of the, other, yeah, thanks, Peter. I mean, and Partners in Health and Peter in particular have done an enormous and incredible job systematizing these learnings in, into a broader healthcare system, which is one of the great successes of this country. 95% of the people are covered or insured, um, and they've invested heavily in uh, replicating the learnings and making them even better. So the Minister of Health, who you saw in this video, I talking about the value of design. I mean, I don't know another Minister of Health that you can get on camera to talk about <coughs> the value of design, um, came to us and then asked if we would help take these learnings and even improve upon them and help, uh, let's say, replicate them. So right now we're working on a new national hospital in the South, which is twice the size uh, with the Ministry of Health. And uh, we're working on writing the, or about to begin writing the national healthcare guidelines for the country. So the infrastructure guidelines for the entire country. So, um, which we had just completed a similar project in Liberia because of this, because of the success of Butaro. So what this learning is, is that if you create great seminal projects, they can affect the, the system itself, the policy itself. And we've gotten very involved in research and policy because of this project. So then that's how we see scale and impact replicating throughout the country. It's so heartening to see so many hands going up. We actually are, in, in my understanding, out of time, and the next session starts immediately. But I wanted to give the final word, and I'm sorry to put you on the spot, uh, to the, the person who's <coughs> spoken the least on the panel, but uh, in so many ways has uh, so much to share. And um, I want to bring it back to what you do so well. Uh, and that's focused on the users. And there's a word that I know Partners in Health and Michael and, and Christian and I all use, um, the word of dignity, but would love to have you try to pull this together, if you can. Uh, <laughs> no warning, of course. <laughs> Excuse me. Tell us a little bit about dignity and design. Well, I th I, I'm always reminded of, uh, I was doing a project with United Way a couple of years ago, and, and one of my um, client counterparts there said that design equals dignity. Um, which I found to be a really powerful statement for a client to make. And I think it's because in Butara, I think is an excellent example of that, is that with great design, beautiful design, a lot, of, a lot of these people are people who usually get passed over when it comes to good design. They get whatever the leftovers are. It's just meet the minimum needs around shelter or a place to work. And by building something beautiful for them, you're sort of saying that we see that you have value and we want to reflect that in a physical and tangible way. And that is just such a powerful statement to communicate to somebody that you value them. I think we all 
have people in our lives who show us that they value us and that that is part of what gives us our reason for living. And just because someone is poor and doesn't have as much resources doesn't mean that they don't deserve exactly the same thing. And so I think this great thing of architecture shifting to this realm is that it is communicating in very real and powerful ways that we see value in all of these people who traditionally have not had that reflected on them. I love that. I love that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Liz. A huge round of applause for our panelists. Thank you all so much for being here. Please understand that buildings shape your lives in a very direct way. Um, and then please walk on the path directly over to Greenwald Tent. The session's starting right now at 9 a.m. Thank you. <laughs>